Good morning and welcome to Elam Chapel on this beautiful Sunday morning. The marathon is running right now on the other side of our home on Santa Monica. And we will be in prayer for all who are there. For all of us who are in church, amen. What a great day to worship our God, to give thanks, to reflect, and to believe that the Lord has an awesome plan for you and I. This morning, I continue my theme of the year, Jeremiah 29, 11. God has a plan for you. It's a good plan. It's a great plan. It's a plan not to harm you. And I repeat that, not to harm you, but to give you a hope and future. And remember, as I've said many times before, the hope is our future. The future is tied to the hope. But this morning, my message is really about making sure that we dig deeper in our faith and our relationship with the Lord. And I'll be coming out of John chapter 7, verse 37, that short little passage to the end of the chapter, where Jesus is speaking at the uh, Feast of the Tabernacles, and he declares those famous words that he has the living waters. And so if you turn to your Bibles quickly, to John 7, 37, reading, on the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flowing from deep within him. He said this about the spirit whom those who believed in him were going to receive, for the spirit had not yet been received because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Let's go back to verse 38 again. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water from deep within him. And so this morning, my, my title is Dig the Well. Dig, dig, dig the well. Dig it deep. Dig it broad. Dig until you hit water. Uh, and the message is a message found from the Old Testament all the way through Isaiah into the New Testament. In fact, John chapter 4, where Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well, is a reference to this, where he speaks to her and tells her that, that he is the one that has living water. And so we'll briefly talk about that in a moment. And I'm going to talk about the text and the importance of this feast and why Jesus stood up and how critical it is for you and I, even though we may have known Jesus for years, we must continually dig the well in our life to remove that which blocks the living water within our life, that we may be fruitful that we may be faithful, that we may be a good servant for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We ask that you would bless our time together. Pray for all who are here, who are watching, who are watching on YouTube, that they will be blessed to know that you are the God that is the living waters. It is through you that we have life. I ask that you would bring clarity of speech I pray that the words would be imparted and our lives would forever be changed as we glorify you this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. So the text is basically wrapped around the Feast of the Tabernacles. And the Feast of the Tabernacles was the most important feast of all the feasts that the Jewish people celebrated, including the Day of Atonement. And you would, many of us would think, well, the Day of Atonement would have to be more important than this one, but truly it's not. The Day of Atonement is that day upon which they atone, the sacrifices given, their sins are forgiven. But the Feast of Tabernacles had two design purposes. Design purpose number one was to remind the nation of Israel when they wandered for those 40 years. So let's go back to in our time capsule, in our time machine, and we are now going to go back to the days of Moses. We have the nation of Israel that has been in captivity for 400 years under Egyptian rulership. They were slaves. And remember, if you go back before that, you have Joseph. Joseph comes on the scene. Remember that his brothers threw him in a pit, sold in a slave, ended up in prison, comes out of prison, and he is the number two man in Egypt. God uses him to help Egypt go through a great famine. The Israelites have gained great prominence, and 
they have uh, been given freedom and the people grew and grew up in Egypt. So at some point, the Egyptian pharaohs had changed over to a Greek pharaoh, okay? And so what happened was the new pharaoh came along, saw how prosperous the Israelites were. They were like locusts, you know, just a lot of them. And decided that, no, he did not want that to happen. And so he started basically restricting their freedoms, and then they ended up being slaves. Moses comes on the scene. God brought him on the scene to, to set the people free. He goes, he does a, a no-no. He kills an Egyptian taskmaster, and he flees, the prince of Egypt, flees to the backside of the wilderness where he wanders around for 40 years. And, you know, many people have many views about the burning bush that was not consumed. I tend to say that God used that burning bush that was not consumed simply because Moses wasn't really paying attention. And God needed to get his attention, just like you and I at times. And Moses listens to God, and God declares his personal pronoun, his personal name, I am the I am. And Moses goes back and leads out those rebellious Israelites from Egypt to the Red Sea. You remember that, splitting the Red Sea into the promised land and moving. And they come to Kadesh Barnea, the 12 spies go into the land. And they come back and 10 of them will go, oh, no, 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 we can't do it. They're giants and grasshoppers or not. Right? Okay. And yet Aaron and Caleb said we could. And Moses decides at that moment to listen to the people and not to God. And so God prohibited them from entering the promised land. And if you remember reading in your Bible, they tried to and they lost the battle and realized, oops, God's not with us. Wouldn't that be vital for us to get within our heads today that either God is with us or he's not, and we need to make sure that we're with him. All right, so from that point for 40 years, the nation of Israel wandered basically the same patch of land. Now you gotta imagine it's 3 million people plus plus all their livestock. And they probably didn't move more than six to eight miles, maybe 10 miles a day, because you had little people, you know, little children, old people, and everybody in between, which means that we really thought it through. They had 66 funerals a day because the generations didn't die off that was rebellious and God was starting over. The front end of the procession, moved into new land, and the back end got to where the new front end was, which means, honestly, they were walking through each other's muck every day for 40 years. And so the Feast of the Tabernacle reminds the nation of Israel of the days they wandered out of disobedience. And they were required on during this feast to bring branches and fawns to build a tabernacle, a temporary tabernacle, where they could have the sun come through and they could see the stars at night, to remind them of when God was with them, even in their wandering. And in many ways, reminds you and I that we are in a temporary tabernacle, this human body, and one day this human body will be no more and we will be with Christ forever. So that was number one, to remind them of the wandering and God's provision and their rebellion and them entering into the promised land. It was a great time of rejoicing. The second reason was the agricultural aspect. It was a time of thanksgiving because it was at the time where the barley and the wheat and the different crops that were planted, the grapes and the figs and the olives were all ready to be harvested. So they're being thankful for what God has done that particular moment, but they're also being thankful and grateful for all that God has done, period. So it served two purposes. One is a reminder and one to be grateful and thankful. And during this time, they would come together and they would march around at the final day. They marched around the altar seven times to remind them of the walls of Jericho that fell. So it was very symbolic, very historical, very agricultural to remind and give 
to give thanks to the Lord. In fact, they quote Psalms 113 and 118, and, and some of the quotes would be, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Oh, work now, uh, then salvation. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Over and over, they're saying this during these days. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because he kept them in those 40 years. He brought them into the promised land, and he's still providing for them year after year after year. And part of this whole dramatic ceremony of giving thanks was the process of the priest taking a pitcher, a, you know, a vase, hold water, that carried about two pints, and went down to the pool of Siloam and filled it with water, and then they would carry it back through the water gate all the way to the temple. So you can imagine this, this, the people on both sides watching the priests come back with the water that would be poured out on the altar. Okay, so you got a picture. Everybody's there. This is one of those mandatory feasts. You did not have an excuse for not being there. Wow, here's a side thought. What if being in church was mandatory? Oops, it is. Do not forsake the assembling of the brethren. And how many of us as Christians have not gone to church for the most nefar nefarious reasons? Uh, you know, I got a ball game. Oh, my football team's playing. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm just tired. Beloved, listen to me. If we're going to worship God, we worship God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our might. Not, we don't give God partially. Uh, can you imagine someone serving you partially? We get upset. If the waiter or the waitress doesn't fulfill the order, doesn't meet our need at the table, we don't give them a good tip. We basically indicate you didn't serve as well as you should have. What if God did not give us a good tip off our service? That's just a side note. This is, this is a feast that everybody that is Israelite, everybody that is Jewish, must come to. It is not an option. You can't make an excuse. And they came joyfully. I can, can you imagine everybody coming into Jerusalem, building these temporary shelters, and then that they're lined up on the last day to watch the water come in to be poured out. And it's on that last day against this backdrop, Jesus speaks, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Now, beloved, this is not just about salvation. This is about every day. How many of us go through times where it feels like our soul is barren? It feels like we're in that dry and thirsty ground. We feel like we're in that, that wilderness, or we feel like we're in that valley struggling along, doing the work of the Lord, doing the ministry, being a good servant. And it's just like, wow, Lord, I just need some of that living water right now. Or maybe you're going through a difficult time. Or maybe it's just, you know, something's going on. Medical report, financial report, people. I mean, we deal with people. How many of you have learned that people are not easy to deal with? And you just need that living water. You're like that woman at the well. You know, that woman who, who had been married so many times that she was not welcome with the, the women of the village because they always went early in the morning. And here she's coming at noontime at the hottest part of the day. And she meets the one that satisfied her thirst. Wouldn't it be awesome, beloved church, if people could come to us and we have the news to satisfy their thirst? Did you know, do you know, that every human on this planet is thirsting for God? Every one of them. They don't recognize it. They don't honor it. They don't accept it, but they are deep within their soul, deep within their being. There is a cry to restore the relationship between them and the God that created them. I don't care what the secular world is teaching. I don't care what the world is teaching at all. 
the Bible says that you and I were created to worship him. All of humanity. I don't care if you don't like what nation they come from or what color their skin is. That's not relevant. God created humanity. Every person out there who is a human, and by the way, that's all of us, was created by God to worship God. Thus, there ought never to be anything other than a desire to see all of humanity come to be restored to that relationship that Adam and Eve broke. And we have broken through our own sinfulness. So here is, in the last day, at the most pivotal point, Jesus stands out and cries out. He didn't speak softly. He cried out that where the masses could hear him. He who thirst, let them come and drink. What a declarative statement. Come. You know, John 4, 14, he says, The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of well, welling up the eternal life. So this message, as I said earlier, is not just a message about salvation. It's not about a message of, hey, to the lost, come, for the living water is here. It's also a message to you and I that we make sure that we keep that living water flowing. And he uses the analogy of a well to help us to understand. So I want to talk about what a well is. A well is something you dig into the ground until you hit water. Note what I just said. Until you hit water, you dig. What is it in your life that you're sitting there and you're saying to yourself, God, help me. I, I struggle with this. I struggle with that. I struggle with my thoughts. I struggle with my tongue. I struggle with my behavior. And, and, you, and the Lord is saying, dig it out. Let's root it out. And you're digging, but because you haven't hit living water, you just stop because you're tired. If you were a farmer back in the 1870s in the plains, you would have dug until you hit water. Because water is life. Psalms 42, 1 and 2 says, As a deer paints, pan, paints, pants, excuse me, for the water. In other words, as a deer paints for the water. And if the deer doesn't get water, the water, they die. You can go without eating. It's called fasting. But you cannot go without water. Within a certain amount of days, your internal organs will start to fail and you will die. It's like air. We must have air, we must have water, and we must have food. You die without air pretty quick. You'll die without water within days. And without food, you'll die within months. And the Bible speaks very clearly that he is the air we breathe. And the Bible speaks very clearly that he is the living water. Note I said living, not stale, not stagnant. And he is the bread of life. I mean, all three of the ingredients that a human body must have to live, he satisfies spiritually for us. He is the very air you breathe. That is so awesome. That was our last song of worship today. Great is our Lord. He is the living water. I love how he uses the word living water because you see in, in Jerusalem, in the Mediterranean area where they don't get a whole lot of water, they have cisterns. And a cistern is something that holds water. But here's the thing about a cistern. The water, when it is gained in the cistern, is fresh and new. But within moments, it's no longer living. In fact, if you aren't careful, you'll grow algae. And that means the water is no longer viable. Cisterns hold water, but it doesn't make it living water. And Jesus is the living water. And I need to ask the question to you and I, do we have living water within us or do we have stale and stagnant water within us? Has our relationship with Jesus become 
just going through the motions? Has it just become a chore? Do, do you worship him with the same fervency that you did the day you were saved and that living water entered you and changed you and made you who you are today? Are you digging the well to ensure that the waters are fresh? Or are you building cisterns that is your way of doing business and not God's? The difference between a cistern and a living well is one is of God and one is of man. Are you building cisterns in your life and trying to dump water in it to satisfy that cannot satisfy? Did you know that you can't drink salt water? Because salt water may satisfy temporarily at thirst, but it will kill you. And it's the same thing with stale water and stagnant water. Have you ever had a cup of water that you just left out? Three days later, you remembered it and you took a drink. And you're like, oh, this is gross. You know, there's a thin layer of dust on it. Maybe a bug or two. And you're like, I'm not drinking this. Well, beloved, if you wouldn't drink it within your body, why in the world would you not allow it within your soul? We need to remember that to be alive, you must breathe, you must drink, and you must eat. And to be alive in Jesus, you must breathe, you must drink the living water, have it within you, and you must eat the bread of life. And if you're not doing that daily, then what are you doing? I mean, think about it. How many of you like to eat? I do. I'm married to a woman who's a foodie. She loves to eat. And she has a wide range of, of, of option plans. I mean, this is great. I mean, I have to tell you, I love Southern California, and God has really given me a heart for Southern California. And I know this is where God has called me, specifically towards Orange County. But... I love it not just because of the people. I don't necessarily, I don't like the traffic, but I do love the people. And I love the wide range of restaurants I can go to. I mean, you name it, we've got it. I can eat it. It's awesome. And if you can imagine a smorgasbord, that is Los Angeles of food. Well, the Bible is our smorgasbord. And it's got so much stuff that, you know what, even if you've been saved for 30, 40, 50 years, it's still new. It's still awesome. It's still satisfying. I mean, I just celebrated on March 15th, my 53rd year of being a born-again believer. Hallelujah. I love it. It's exciting. I'm more in love with him today than I was 53 years ago because of what he's done. And I realized the imperativeness and, and the importance within my soul to make sure the living water is flowing. And I'm not damming it up, blocking it off, trying to do what I want to do with it. Let the river flow could be the cry of our heart. Let the living waters flow. Dig, dig, dig. Break up that fallow ground. Break up that hard ground. Break up that ground that, that is blocking the waters. Dig. Don't build cisterns. Oh, look at my cistern of academic understanding. My cistern of titles. My cistern of this and that. Man, that, that is all man. All we're going to hear at the end is well done, thou good and faithful servant, if we are. I'm not going to, Jesus is not going to look at me and say, oh, hello, the most white Reverend Gregory Scott Benson, bachelors of art, masters of theology, blah, blah, blah. He's going to call me whatever name is in the Lamb's Book of Life that I don't even know. He's not going to have all my titles. But he is going to acknowledge that I was his shepherd that he gave to the church. That's not going to be taken away from me. The apostles are the apostles, the pastors are the pastors, the prophets, evangelists, teachers, all of them. 
Those don't go away. But all this stuff that's man-made that we have to do to satisfy man's laws and man's regulations are not living waters. They are what we have to do that we are effective in the country we live in. And thus we have to do it. Do I agree with credentialing? Do I agree with Bible colleges and seminaries? Yes, if it's life-giving. Yes, if it prepares you. Yes, if it causes you to fall in love with Jesus. I'm not in favor of man-made rules and regulations that take us away from Christ. I'm only in favor of that will, that will enhance and enable us for the kingdom. So, are you building cisterns, holding water, or are you allowing living waters to flow? It's man's ways or God's ways. That's the critical point that you need to hear. We need to dig deep within our soul those areas of our life that is stopping us from being all that Jesus wants us to be. We need to choose to do the labor with the Holy Spirit to root out those areas that are areas of bondages, strongholds, we need to stop making excuses and start being honest to say, yes, Lord, I need you. Do you thirst today? Are you thirsty today? Are you able to say, Lord, I need you today? And if that is the cry of your heart, then God is going to reward that cry with living water, and he'll give you the ability and a shovel to dig. What are you talking about? I'm talking about being honest. I'm talking about not going through the motions. I'm talking about not making excuses, cop-outs of what God wants you to be. Of not saying to God, I know, and you just continue on. When the Holy Spirit speaks, oh, I know, and you continue on. That's rebellion. And no parent that loves their child would allow that. A child that decides to speak in a dishonorable way. You're being dishonorable to your mom. I know, and they continue on. There's no way in the world that you would ever allow that to happen. Can you imagine being pulled over by the police officer because you're speeding? And the officer looks at you and goes, you know, the speed limit is 65. I know. You were going 90. I know. And, and, and continuing on as if it means nothing. That is not an attitude of repentance. That is not an attitude of humility. That is not an attitude of humbleness. And honestly, that is not an attitude of God. The I know and you continue on the course of action that is detrimental and not life-giving, is rebellion. And that means you have a cistern. You don't have living water because living water doesn't allow that. I'm not talking perfection. You've heard me say this probably every week now. But we are talking about moving towards perfection. We are talking about God calling us towards perfection, though we know we will never be perfect. We strive forward. We move forward, letting go of that which is behind us, and we move forward. The people running a marathon is going to learn rapidly. Stop looking back. you got to look forward to where you're going. So if we're going to dig these wells, if we are going to, to choose to have living waters within our soul, then we must be honest to say, Lord, I am thirsty. Water, right here. Thirsty. Got to have it. Six to eight glasses a day. Thirsty. Lord, I'm thirsty. Because if you're not thirsty, something is wrong. You have buried that well. In fact, in the days of, of uh, military fighting and wars back in the day, one of the things they would do is they would 
block up all the wells. They would actually throw stones and everything into the wells to block those wells so that the people that they conquered <clears throat> or they were trying to defeat didn't have water. So I think that what happens in our life is that we allow our sinful condition or, or I'm just going to just go through the motions. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'll go to church when I want to, read the Bible when I want to. And we we end up filling the well, and thus water doesn't come through. And, you know, we could actually take this analogy between us and God to each other. How often do we do the same thing with each other in relationships, husbands and wives? You know, that well of love that's supposed to be eternal and living, according to the First Corinthians 13. And what do we do? Oh, we put throw in a stone here, a stone there. Then, you know, one month, five months, a year, five years, 10 years later, hey, I don't really love you anymore. I don't love you. What What's the problem? It isn't the other person. It's you. It's the fact that you have chosen to stick things in the well of love. See how this message could really apply not only horizontally, but vertically and vertically horizontally. What relationships have we changed because we have chosen to dam up the well? We've taken that river and we dammed that river. And now the water is depleting. Look at Lake Mead. Everybody's worried because that lake's so low, never in the history. And now states are worried about getting adequate water. See, Drought, famine, water, though that is a human thing that happens in countries, in our country particularly too, it's also really reflective of spiritual life. That's why Jesus used the analogy here in the Feast of Tabernacles to get everybody's attention. If you want living waters, all you have to do is ask. If you blocked up the living water, you built a dam, all you have to do is tear it down. It's not a hard process, but you've got to be honest. You've got to stop deluding yourself. You've stop, got to stop living in a fantasy world of saying, I'm okay with God when you're not. you got to be real. It's kind of like those physical exams we get with our doctor every year, and they do lab work, and they look at you and go, well, you know... This is what the labs are saying. Well, the weight scale is saying, yeah, you need to stop eating those donuts or whatever it may be. We need to have a spiritual assessment, honestly, every day. That's how critical this is. We need to choose, to be honest. Number two, God will encourage you to do this. The Lord will encourage you to dig. The Lord will encourage you. He'll be with you, alongside you, speaking to you, giving you songs of worship in the most difficult time that you accomplish this purpose of digging. Three, Satan will resist you. I'll say it again. Satan will, is going to resist you. He's going to lie to you. He's going to show you stuff on the internet. He's going to show you pastors that say you don't have to do it. It's okay. Live free. Jesus loves you. There's no heaven, no hell. Hey, it's cool. Just be you. And I need to tell you something. He's got, he's got, he is the master market dude. He is the master commercial maker to get us to do everything but what God wants. Satan will resist you. Push through, fight through. Number four, stay in worship. Stay worship. It's too much hype. Hey, guys, there are pastors out there that say you shouldn't have worship like we do today. I need to remind them. David danced before the Lord in an, in an undignified way. Who are we to declare what worship is? Go look at the Feast of Tabernacles. It's for all you dudes out there that are against modern-day worship. That is worship, by the way. I mean worship. I don't mean 
grandstanding and, and being, you know, performing. Leave it alone. Go to Africa. Go to another country. Watch how they do it. Break out of your little cistern of this is the way we have to do it and get into the living waters and let the Holy Spirit guide you. Listen to me. You want to raise your hand, raise your hands. You want to jump, jump. You want to dance, dance. But do it unto the Lord. Deepen your worship. Oh, I don't like the songs. I just want the sermon. Then you really don't understand what worship is about. And you're holding back. It's like the Lord's saying, I got a mighty river. I want to flow through you. And you're like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want a mighty one. Just give me a trickle. Give me a little bit of you, God. I can't handle all of you. You're like a rich chocolate. I can't eat that much. And why are we doing that? Because we want to control. Hey, listen out there, beloved saints. When we tell God to hold back, it's because we want to be in control. Let it go. Let it be. Get in that ocean and let God do his thing. But do it unto him, not unto you. Otherwise, you're building a cistern. And fifth, don't give up. 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 Even when you see water, just because you see the water doesn't mean you give up. You keep digging until the water lifts you out of that well. You just start swimming on up. Don't stop just because you got a dollar. Listen to me. I don't want a little bit of God. I want all of God. And if we're going to fulfill God's plan in this country and in this world and in your city and in your family and in your life, then you need to have an attitude of God. I want all of you. Let it come. Let it flow through all of me. That's what we need to do. God's not going to do it if you're not willing to do anything. You didn't get saved just because God did it. You had to do something. You had to say, Lord, I, yes. Remember, three things happen to salvation. Holy Spirit moves. There's an emotional response and volition. You had to make a choice. Yes, Jesus, I want you as Lord and Savior. And then you have to live for him. He empowers you, you live. So what is your life? If God is to throw a bubble above your head, whoop, and it had cistern and living waters, what would the percentages be? 55% cistern, 45% living water. Ah, oh, man, that's not good. That, that means you're, you're going to end up drying out on this side. Well, what is it today? Be honest. Are you thirsty? And if you look at me today and go, no, I'm not thirsty, I'm, I'm okay, I'm satisfied, then we have a problem. So, I'm going to remind you of the five points. You must be honest. You must be thirsty. The Lord will encourage you. That is the truth. Satan is going to resist you. You must deepen your worship. You must deepen your time with the Lord, however that may be. And five you keep on digging even when you hit water. If I was looking at you today and said, I want you to dig until you hit gold, I could guarantee every one of you listening to me would be digging. And if you had a pebble, you keep on digging. You're going to hit that gold vein. You're not going to be accepting just a pebble. No, 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 because it, you know, it's gold. You're going to dig until you get it all. Well, beloved, let's dig until we get it all so that we can live the life of Christ in him, that we may see his glory, that we may receive those words we all long for. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's all I want to hear. But until that day comes upon which he takes me home, I want to be in his living water where I will thirst no more. What about you? I pray you take the words to heart. Hey, if you're listening to this on YouTube, listen to it two or three times. If I'm on Facebook. You can find me. Send me a message. I'm here to encourage you that the God above has not given up on you and on me. May you be blessed in all you do today. Thank you and blessings.